So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, really great to see so many people joining us. Um, we've got uh, the first of our Let's Go Zero webinars today um, being uh, delivered to our live audience, but also being recorded so it can go on our website for those who can't join us at this time to be able to watch it. So it's really great to see so many of you here and do um, make sure that you make use of the question and answer and the chat function to be able to ask us questions during the, the Q&A sessions dur during the afternoon. So we've got an hour um, and we're going to really focus on how schools can get started because that's the question we get a lot of. So I'm Alex Green. I um, work for the Let's Go Zero campaign. I work for Ashton and we, we run the campaign with lots of other organisations who make it a really exciting campaign. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague Suzanne, who's here as well as me, who's here from GAP as well, and her colleague Bina should be joining us as well um, soon. And also we've got Ed and Rick here from two schools who are going to tell us about their wonderful experiences so that they, um, they, can, they can share what they're doing as well. So we are going to talk a bit about, I'm going to explain a little bit about Let's Go Zero and where we are, just to give you a quick update about what the campaign's been up to. So I'm aware that lots of the people who have joined us today and the attendees, they, they are already Let's Go Zero schools, but some of you might be thinking about it or you might be thinking of talking to schools about it. So um, the campaign has been going since uh, November 2020. So it's it's still relatively new. So there's lots to share and there's lots to, lots to talk to you and, and update you about. Um, it has been a, a busy year. It's It's been a it, it's been very exciting from our side of things. We've been engaging with um, lots and lots of people and schools and organisations. We were really busy at COP. We got to meet the Secretary of State and, and really talk to them about what they can do and how they can support schools. And the campaign's really growing. I mean, even with uh, all the challenges that COVID has thrown at us and schools, we've really thrived. And we're now on over 1,100 schools have signed up. So that's a really exciting place to be. Um, and schools are showing that actually, even in these really challenging times that we're all facing, particularly now, schools are showing they want to be leaders, they want to be climate leaders. So what's what lies ahead for, for Let's Go Zero? We're going to continue to prove that demand. So to count those numbers of schools that are signing up to show that schools really do want to be leaders, they want to be zero carbon. We're going to move, create that movement for change, really help schools by doing these webinars, by doing lots of press work, by really showing that this is what schools want to do and that they really want to take action. And then we're going to be working with the Department for Education and other key people to, to help make that policy change really take place. So it's a busy year ahead. We've we're, we're really quite delighted now when we look at the map of our schools that have signed up. They're everywhere. And we've got schools that are enormous. The schools are there's over, over 2,000 students there. And we've got a school that's got five students. So we've got everything. And we're, we're reaching into so Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales a lot better. We're just about to have our, um, our, our website fully translated into Welsh. It'll be any day now. So by early March, the whole website will also be in Welsh, which is super exciting from our side of things. Um, but yeah, we, we're just so chuffed when we look at the map and it, it get so much pride about this campaign that we've been that we've been nurturing over the year to see how many schools are signing up. And it really shows that schools are so passionate about this and their ambition is so strong. So on to the sort of the, the details and the, 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 the important stuff, really, which is the policy change work. You don't need to read this all now, but it's on our website. These are our policy asks that we're taking to government and we're talking to key people in Department for Education and other government departments about to try and really get that change so that every school is enabled to and supported to take action and to be zero carbon by 2030. Um, and we're getting a really good response and we, and we hope that, that that will lead to some exciting things in the future. One thing that you can do as a school to play your part in this is to uh, give your input into the, the Department for Education's Sustainability and Climate Change Strategy. It's a draft strategy now. It was launched at COP um, and it, you've got about an, a couple of weeks. You've got until middle of March to respond with your with your feedback and they want to know what you think. 
They want to know your suggestions, your ideas, your, your criticism, they want to know. So there's an email address on the screen there. You just write to them, just email a team. So probably by mid-March at the latest, we think, read the document and have a look and just tell them what you think, tell them how they could improve it or idea, ideas or suggestions or what's worked within your school or within your organizations that you think can help them. And they genuinely want to know what they can do. So we really encourage you to do that. Um, so now we're gonna move straight on to Suzanne, who's a part of the Let's Go Zero team, who's going to talk to you about what schools are doing and introduce the, our, our brilliant group of people here who are gonna to speak today. Amazing. Thank you, Alex. Um, it really has been an incredible year for the campaign. And I'm pleased to say that the Let's Go Zero community is just growing in strength. Um, so just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Suzanne Gibbon, the Let's Go Zero program coordinator. Now, I've been part of the year supporting uh, part of the team supporting for the past year now. Um, and it's been really inspirational. And if uh, you could move to the next slide, Alex, please. So here are just a little snippet of our schools. So we have schools joining that are right at the start of their journey and some that are well on their way to zero carbon. I've had the honor of speaking to some of these amazing schools and you'll be hearing from a couple of them shortly um, about how they're embedding sustainability within their school gates and curriculum and empowering their students and staff and influencing their local communities. And as part of the Let's Go Zero campaign, we really want to build this nationwide community of support to enable the opportunity for us to learn from each other, seek help when we need it, so that no school is left behind. And we're about to hear from two different schools and the journey that they've been on. However, I, before I introduce them, I wanted to just highlight some other steps schools have taken across the UK to show you that no action can be too small when aiming for a better, fairer and zero carbon future. So here on the slide, you can see students from St. Catherine's Park Primary in Glasgow that are surrounding the, the pink planter. And they fundraise for outdoor equipment by having an, a non-uniform day. And they now regularly have outdoor learning days. And just above them, you can see another school from Glasgow, Corpus Christ Christi and their students learning about the climate crisis through their interaction with COP26 back in November. In the middle, you can see students from St. Francis Xavier from North Yorkshire who are weighing their school's food waste with all the schools surrounding them so they can see the impact of their food's um, waste and, and help to reduce it. And in the bottom right, you can um, see we've got down high school students from Northern Ireland and amongst other things that they do, they've been taking part in a litter pick. So schools, as you can see, across the country are installing solar panels for clean electricity. They're creating wildflower meadows and bug hotels for biodiversity and installing scooter and bike parks to encourage active travel. And I recently spoke to a head teacher, Rob, from um, Cheney School in Oxford. And he told me that a huge part of the work that they're doing is just to eliminate waste. And by waste, he means from energy, by turning off the lights when they're not being used, um, from water, by identifying leaks and fixing them. And in turn, he mentioned it's, you know, not only saving the planet, but it saves the school a substantial amount of money. So some of these actions schools do can be done to support their students and staff while others are more systems level, so switching to a green electricity provider. It's really been inspiring hearing all these stories and seeing schools as a sector really leading the way. So um, I've kind of done a quick overview, but we'll hopefully go into a lot more depth and inspire you guys to start making those small steps. So I'm going to hand over to our two guest speakers here today. First, we have Rick Waits, who is the executive head teacher of Monk Freeston Primary in North Yorkshire, who is going to talk a little about the actions his school has been taking towards climate neutrality, the environment his students, are, uh, environmental work his students are doing, and the support that they're giving the local community buildings project. So over to you, Rick. That's great. Thanks, Suzanne. And, and hopefully um, that's showing on the screen. And what I have to try and work out is how I then move that forwards. 
There we go. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, so as Suzanne said, um, I'm um, a head teacher uh, of a uh, one form entry primary school in North Yorkshire between Leeds and Selby. Uh, we've got 210 children on roll uh, and our school is about 20 years old. Uh, and we've been uh, working um, really hard on lots of different aspects of environmental education, but most particularly to achieve um, carbon zero. Um, and, and I'll just sort of talk you through um, how uh, we started that project and where we've got to to date. And I think the starting point for us were, was that we feel we've got uh, a moral responsibility to um, model within the community what that would look like. Um, we've got that sort of unique position within the community to educate our children, but also influence our families. Uh, and if we're gonna sell that message, we ought to be doing it ourselves. So that was our starting point. Um, and we've had that interest for, for quite some time. We've had uh, eco warriors, we recycle quite widely. We've got a recycle uh, scheme on site. Um, we are paperless as far as we can be uh, and cashless, uh, but we'd sort of come to a point where we needed to, to make the next step. Um, and I was approached by a member of, of the community uh, two years ago who um, said he was interested in starting a scheme with the community buildings within the village. Uh, our village has a community centre, church, church hall, school, cricket club and football club. And he said um, it would be great if those um, stakeholders could work together with a view to achieving carbon neutrality. Um, and that was a great idea for us because that was where we wanted to evolve as a school. But um, if we were going to do that, we needed to, to give it enough uh, time, resource and energy. So I actually deferred it for a little while. I said, if we're going to do this, we'll do this properly. It needs to be in, in the school development plan. We need to capture interest. We need to get everybody involved in it. And so we, we did delay for, for six months, um, but then it was written into the school development plan and we started a collaborative project. Um, our children were drivers in that because they were telling us that they have a real interest in uh, the environment, uh, in climate change um, and uh, they wanted to, to do work with that. So uh, we started the, the project and the logos on the screen, we came up with a, a green buildings logo. Um, and they also wanted to pursue um, the Eco Schools Green Flag Award. Um, and that gave us a focus for looking at how we can strengthen uh, the educational provision around um, environmental aspects and, and uh, carbon neutrality. So um, we, we started on a project, um, quick wins. I'm not sure how quick they were. Some of them were quick, but we've been at this for two years now. Um, and um, what we set off to do was um, capture that interest within the wider community. So uh, our children designed a logo um, and the winning design was made up into a badge. Um, on, I've got mine on and all, all children got a badge to take home. Uh, we uh, asked for contributions from the PTA in terms of interest, not financial contribution, but voluntary and, and, and interest, but also the wider community. So uh, we signed people up to the project um, that was done electronically and in paper. So uh, the school, we used our printing facilities uh, and volunteers then posted an update through every house in the village to say this is the project that we've started um, if you're interested sign up to the, the, the mailing list and we'll keep you informed um, from there all of the the, the project uh, group members submitted an application for funding which we used to develop a feasibility study of how each of the buildings and how the project as a whole could achieve uh, carbon zero. Um, and that was amazing. It, it was really valuable in opening our eyes to what technology is available to us, what the right solution would be for us and how we could develop that with each of our buildings um, and, and what a, a proposal would, be, would look like for, for removing fossil fuels uh, from our buildings. Um, and that gave us a, a, a real starting point 
he is a school and, and the fabric of the school to, to achieve uh, net zero. Alongside that, the children were working on uh, the eco schools materials, um, conducting an environmental audit, uh, action planning for activities that would uh, strengthen our curriculum and strengthen our provision. And one of those areas that they looked at was energy. So that went hand in hand with our other project work. Um, and some of the funding that we got as a project financed a, a thermal imaging camera that we share between all of those um, buildings within the, the project. And so the children used it. Um, part of their Eco Warriors work was um, to look at the fabric of the building to see where our heat loss was, uh, to see how well insulated we are. Um, and, and they use that information. Um, we noted that some of our aging window frames were really drafty. Um, they weren't great thermal insulators. Um, and that helped us put a, a request to our multi-academy trust to replace some of those windows. So uh, we had a whole wall replaced over last summer and that thermal imaging work we've done now can spot a difference in, in the um, thermal retention between the new windows and the old ones. So uh, we're, we're getting quite a strong argument there for uh, how we can improve uh, the fabric of our building. Um, we did come across quite a few barriers. Um, one was the, the size of the project. Um, it really does require personal energy uh, and buy-in from people. It's not something that can be done uh, easily, lightly. Uh, it, it does need quite a lot of, of time and it does need people to, to join in and collaborate together. Um, we want to, as a school, achieve uh, a removal of fossil fuels. And um, to be able to do that requires quite a, a lot of funding. And that was our biggest barrier because the funding that's available to us is really limited. Uh, we don't qualify for charity funding and, and lots of the grants that other organisations could could apply for, schools are excluded from. Um, and I applied for government funding in the first round of SALIX, uh, second round in phase two, uh, and was uh, declined. And, and it just felt like at each stage of that application, there were barriers put up to us. Um, we also found contract were a massive barrier because we were trying to do this through lockdown but we also find that contractors are really busy and they're already um, dedicated to projects elsewhere and so it was hard to get them to come and advise us and really hard to get them to quote for us um, particularly because if they are lending their technical expertise to us they're taking the risk that they may not then get a subsequent contract and so they're a little bit reluctant to to help um, and that's massive when you're faced with some really technical questions uh, and technical challenges in achieving a funding for a solution um, that as a teacher, I can't answer. Um, it needs spe specialist knowledge, but we couldn't get the specialists to commit because it was too big a risk for them. So that was um, a, a real challenge for us. And the other thing we needed to think through was uh, sustainability in the project. You know, we do have a turnover of staff. We do have um, people who, who are interested in the project and then maybe change roles or move on. And how do we maintain that momentum? How do we maintain that education for children and their buy-in um, because it needs someone leading and driving that. Um, and just to finish with, uh, the successes we've had to date, um, things I'm really proud of, we started uh, the Green Flag Award 12 months ago, but achieved it within 12 months. So we got the Bronze Award, Silver Award and the Green Flag by July last year, which we're really proud of. Um, we also did a lot of work during lockdown, a lot of environmental projects for children. So their remote learning uh, projects were um, environmental based and we entered those into the Best Energy Awards and, and got an award for those. Um, a massive success in terms of the partnership working. Um, we're working with our local community, but also wider stakeholders, uh, energy consultants and advisors throughout the local area and, and nationally as well. And that networking is really great for us. Um, and finally, I was delighted that um, this week 
we got the news that we've been successful in the phase three um, SADEX uh, application. So we have got a, a, a grant now to install a ground source heat pump and remove uh, gas uh, fossil fuel for all of our heating and hot water systems. So we're hoping to achieve that by September, which is, is a massive success. And that's me. Amazing. Thanks so much, Rick. And um, I know you face some barriers and probably a lot of school can, schools can admit that they face similar barriers. But um, hearing that you've now been awarded the SALEX funding for the, the, the final round is really, you know, it's really hopeful and it shows a bit of perseverance can pay off. And I mean, the um, Let's Go Zero campaign is all about getting that extra support and funding for schools. So hopefully it will eliminate those barriers that are, you know, schools are facing every every day with trying to install sustainable actions. But thank you, Rick, for, for sharing. Um, You're very welcome. <laughs> I would just like to now um, introduce our second speaker, Ed Moore. Um, he's a teacher and eco-coordinator at Damer's First School in Dorset. So Ed spent the last 10 years building up the eco-work at Damer's um, from an absolute blank canvas. And he's going to be telling the story of the school's journey so far from zero to eco heroes. So I'll um, hand over to Ed now. Um, if you can unmute yourself, Ed, that would be great. Cool. Cheers. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we started, um, we saw our journey 10 years ago, but we're, we're still trying to make lots of impact within our school. Um, and that's why we wanted to sign up to Let's Go Zero. We wanted to, we wanted every child to leave Damas with a real awareness of the, the local and the national global environment. And, and how each one can really uh, make a difference to the quality of the environment for everybody and make that huge impact within the community. Um, so uh, we, as a school, um, we had a little competition across the school about sort of the areas that we wanted to work on. And we put together this eco code um, and we're already part of the eco schools, uh, but we wanted to sort of uh, get this across the school a bit more and make it a bit more clearer to to children and adults of what we sort of what we were working towards um so uh with the help of a graphic designer locally who uh, gave up his time for free um uh he he with um a group of children um who collated all the ideas uh, came up with this amazing eco code which is quite engaging um really attracts the eye and the attention of, of the staff and the adults and the visitors that we have around our school and Everybody knows what we're working towards and and um, what we're what, what, and what we're aiming for. Um, so our garden is quite an important important part of our work, and uh, as you can see, um, each um, we, each child has an opportunity in the afternoons to grow fruit and veg. And we have these amazing volunteers from the Rotary and from WI that come in every afternoon to work with the children, and it takes a bit of a Bit, bit of pressure off the off the teachers um, uh, and some teachers aren't uh, so confident in the garden um, so uh, we've got lots of volunteers that um, haven't got in the garden but they've got an allotment or they just want to share their knowledge of um, of their gardening skills um, we've also got a plastic bo bo bottle greenhouse that we made sort of eight years ago and it's still standing and we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't uh, had to replace any, any of the bottles yet. Um, and literally all our seedlings go through that bottle, uh, plastic bottle greenhouse, and then into our garden. And then we harvest the fruit and veg and the children get an opportunity to learn how to cook that fruit and veg and make British dishes. Um, and the idea was uh, we wanted to work towards the RHS um, Garden Awards. And we managed to get to uh, uh, level five. So we are a five star garden. And also we, um, we applied for the Cultivation Street competition, which is really good. Um, and we we came second, um, winning some winning about 1,500 pounds, which has then gone towards a, an eco garden. Um, 
but yeah, th this is like the fruit and veg that we've that we've grown uh, that we've got from uh, from our gardens. And there's me in the corner. Uh, we do a bit of a potato competition. Who can grow the the heaviest potato, the the smallest potato? Um, really good little thing for a bit bit of maths, bit of weighing. Uh, we try and link uh, our garden to our curriculum as much as as um, as we can. Um, so the children. Um, the children came to me and they they, they wondered if um, we could do uh, uh, find a way that we could compost all our food waste on site because um, we had so much food waste uh, going um, and instead of sending it off uh, in the council bins um, we came up with this idea to raise some money for a Ryden food waste composter um, so all our food waste goes onto that to make really good compost for our, for our school garden um, and we've got so much now that we're, having, we're now selling it to the, to the local community for a donation. Uh, so we're actually helping them to, to grow their fruit and veg. And it's a, we, you know, we teach them about, about it's a good um, example of uh, teaching children about the full cycle of um, a full life cycle of what happens to their food. Um, and, then, and, then, and then it's helping them to reproduce more food um, within our gardens. Um, and then this is our, this is our nature area. So, it was an orchard and we decided to turn it into a nature area. Um, the, again, the school children, um, they wanted a, a nature area or a pond and um, they got to choose the, the wildflowers to, to ha ha uh, help design it and um, help to, to, to fundraise as well. Um, they, they made different enterprise eco products that they, they sold. Um, they sold to the um, to the parents and into in shops and in, into the community, um, and a lot of the a lot of the prize money that we've won has gone into this, as well as um, the money that we raise through recycling uh, items within our within our community. Um, so uh, we came with this idea um, to make every class make a pledge um, to help animals, people, and the environment. And this is through, this is part of our curriculum. It's not a bolt on, it's not something separate. It's literally embedded in everyday life of what we do. So each class makes a pledge and they've got to include the, the sustainable development goals. And then um, they do, a, we do a, have a big assembly. Um, they've been virtual sadly, but they do a big assembly and uh, they tell everybody else what their pledge is going to be. And then they go out um, into the into the community. Um, there's there's time put aside within class, and uh, they they do their campaign, they do their pledge, and we've had things like um, tips for for a waste free lunch for parents and 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 children. We've had uh, encouraging the local community to feed the birds. Uh, we've had uh, raising money to sponsor an animal, putting food hampers together for people in need. Uh, random acts of kindness, uh, tying, tying up your local community uh, on litter picks um, and raising money to twin a toilet. Uh, and this is the recycling centre that I was talking to you about. Uh, so basically we, we recycle uh, cartridges, um, writing instruments, crisp packets, uh, toothpaste tubes, uh, cake wrappers, biscuits, um, yeah, literally anything and anything. Um, and we got the whole community involved. So we got uh, we got drop off points at uh, supermarkets, at post offices, at estate agents. Um, and yeah, we, we, we probably make about 400 pounds, I think, each term just on our, our recycling. And then that goes back into um, our eco projects, um, our, our zero carbon projects that we're, we're sort of aiming for. And it's it's really good money. And um, you know, we've got the PTA involved as well because they help us sort out uh, the boxes um, and help pack, pack them off and send them off. Um, and we've also got the PTA involved um, having co conversations with uh, our council uh, to help reduce the waste that they use within their um, events that they put on. So making sure they've got a like sort of um, waste free um like for cakes and things and and drinks and making sure it's uh, it's recyclable and there isn't too much waste there uh, that, and we don't use clean film uh, we're 
we're a single use plastic free school and we're pretty much 95% there on single use free plastic. And this is all part of it. Uh, the children wrote off letters uh, to the, um, the businesses that we work with within our school. Um, and uh, we now have our milk in um, glass milk bottles. We have these beakers that they give us. So um, that cuts down the waste of how you use, car use cartons or straws. Um, uh, we campaign to have a, a refill tap uh, in our local town. And uh, we've got two now. The, the town council uh, allowed us to have two after the children did a, a good pitch to them. Um, and our fruit, our fruit comes in just cardboard boxes. Uh, they don't come in plastic, uh, but that was a bit of a challenge. Uh, the company that the children wrote off to uh, sort of emailed back and sort of said they weren't going to do it. Um, you know, uh, it, and it was, there was lots of to and froing for sort of 12 months and a few phone calls as well. Um, I would type in the number and then just give the telephone to, to the child, to the children. Um, and eventually they, a um, bit of perseverance and refusing to say no, um, they eventually came around to our way of thinking and um, yeah, they, 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 they agreed to send all the fruit in, uh, in cardboard boxes, which is great. Um, through uh, working with uh, Strands, great organization. Uh, we've got 6% of our school coming by bike or scooter or walking. Um, we did lots of um, bike days, lots of bling, your bike, uh, bling up your bike days or um, uh, doctor bike days where um, we, we would have some, we had a few uh, people in from Strands to help uh, look, sort of tinker with your bike and make sure it was working okay. And um, then we also work with the strands. Um, some people, obviously, they've got to drive to work, which is fine. Um, but we tried to um, come up with a map uh, so they could park a bit further away so we'd have better air quality. Um, but then they could walk or scoot or bike still to school. So they'd all have that opportunity. And it's been a great success. More and more parents are doing this. And they're even, so, you know, for two or three days a week, they will park even further away so their kids can bike or scoot or walk in school, which is fantastic. Um, so um, for the kids and our school, um, it's brought, they've brought so much passion and confidence. Uh, they speak really, really well and confident about, about their environment and where they want to go. They believe in what they are doing and they think that what they're doing is gonna make a real big difference. Uh, they're determined, they, they don't take no for an answer. You don't want to meet, you know, one of our children on the street, particularly if it's anything linked to the environment, because, um, you know, that they're really passionate about um, how they feel about their environment. Uh, they're inspired. They want to go out into the community. And they've now, you know, on the back of our pledges, they've now got their own little campaigns that um, they want to go and achieve. Um, and they give up, you know, their weekends and after schools to do this, which is fantastic. You know, that's what we want. Um, and their knowledge has been broadened to the fact that they're, they're telling off their parents at home for, for uh, using cling film or, you know, or uh, going to the supermarket and buying fruit or veg in, in a plastic bag and, um, and telling them that they, they should buy it loose sort of thing. Um, and, you know, these skills, you know, that, that, they're, they're, that they are like developing is, you know, what they're going to need for later life. So it's so important and they're doing a great job and we're really proud of them. And that's me. Well, thank you, Ed. That is the, so inspiring. And, and Rick as well. Just amazing work going on. It's just so much stuff. And it shows that there are so many different things that schools can do and that they it's not all the same. And it's not all just based on energy or water or waste. There's that so many different activities. And bringing the students in, you, you know, Ed was describing there about you making them do the phone calls it really works like really sort of embracing the kids not just as uh, as learners but also as people who can work magic for you so yeah that's fantastic to hear we've also got Bina who's here now also from uh, GAP so I'm going to bring her onto the stage in a minute um, but we we've got a little bit of time for some questions uh, so any questions that have come uh, that you've got either for Ed or for Rick 
Um, and then we can we can move on to hear about the Global Action Plan's uh, Climate Action Plan at all, which is a brilliant way for schools to get started on their actions. So first question that's come in um, uh, for Ed is, uh, it's a, it seems like this is a lot of work. How did you get buy-in from your senior leadership team? What was the thing that did it? Um, I think it was that, that it was gonna, the impact that it was going to make on the children. At the end of the day, you know, these are our future, and and the fact that you know, I went to them and they and I said, look, you know, this is going to make a huge impact on them, and they are our future, and um, you know, they're going to get so much from this, and you know, and it's shown that you know the confidence they they they've uh, they've instilled within themselves, and the knowledge that they've gained um, is you know just phenomenal. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. You can see the confidence that comes from it. Um, and a question for Rick as well. So how do you work with other schools? So we've seen that you've got your great thermal imaging camera. Like, do you lend that out to other schools? How are you engaging with other schools? And then my, I, a quick question I'm going to add into that person's question is, did you did you um, buy your own thermal imaging camera? Because I've seen that a lot with schools using them and sometimes they can borrow them. They might have them in a science department, they might borrow them from a local authority. How did you get yours and, and, and would you recommend it? Yeah, we, we didn't buy it. We bought it as a part of the project. So actually the, the community association made the purchase, but it's owned collectively across all of the stakeholders in the project. Um, and we, um, we've got that now as a resource that we use between all of the buildings, but also now we've started to see the influence of the project go through the community. We've got um, parents and, and, and homeowners around the community asking to borrow it so that they can survey their own home and see how uh, energy efficient it is, which, which is great. Um, we haven't yet loaned it to other schools because there's so much demand still within our own um, project group. Uh, we tried to take um, photographs and, and, and use it to survey at different points in the year and it wasn't quite as effective in the summer when we were getting the same sort of temperatures inside and outside. So that's narrowed down the window of when we can use that effectively. Um, and so we're st there's still high demand, really high demand amongst all the project members. So we haven't shared that with other schools yet, but we have sold our story and shared that. Uh, so we've got other schools within our multi-academy trust who have seen what we're doing and are now they've signed up to the uh, eco schools uh, and, and are trying to uh, achieve the awards through the eco schools program and are seeing how we're working. One of our other schools has already achieved uh, the green flag um, and they've taken a slightly different route and they're, they're working with Sustrans as well and looking at uh, transportation. They've chosen that as one of their big threads and have uh, increased bike storage within school um, and, and looked at transportation as a route. So they sort of looked at how we did it, use that model, but then took it in their own direction. Thank you. That's that's really, really interesting to hear. And we've had another question in about secondary schools, how this how all of this applies to large secondary schools. And we are aware that our our guests today are from primary schools and we did have a secondary school lined up, but they had to they had to pull out last minute. But um, a lot of it is very transferable, actually, because a lot of the, the, the impact of schools is through the, the site of the building and the use of a building and you're running an organisation effectively. So there's a lot of that. Is, there is a lot of crossover. So we've seen really good engagement and actually the, the student engagement changes because you 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 change from having a, a small army of sort of worker bees which you get in, in the primary schools to actually when you start using your your sixth form students your stem clubs you get this real insight and knowledge um, and then you can start incorporating it into learning you can start that concept of of a living lab so what if we put insulation on one building rather than the other what's the difference measuring the impact and that can be really exciting when you've got those sort of older learners um, the other things to do is, is is about food and meals can be really exciting in secondary school there's a there's a bit more choice there's a bit more freedom and there's a lot more influence out into households as well when you're looking at secondary schools and the way that they can engage so we've seen uh, a secondary school where they did an assembly on uh, the, the concept of going sort of eating less meats being more plant-based and, and why and the carbon impact and they could see straight away 
there was a change in behaviours in what what the students were ordering in in the canteen over the next few weeks. So it's really interesting to see how those those older students can be used. I don't know whether Suzanne, you might have um, examples of some of the schools you've you've sort of spoken with who who are secondaries that um, you can share with us. Yeah, definitely. Um... I'm I've just lost the name, but there, there's one school just outside of Bristol who um, have their head boy and head girl. Um, part of their sort of remit is a bit of environmental work and they just ran with it and they really, really influenced, you know, peer learning and peer support to influence change within the school environment is you shouldn't um, sort of let that slip by because it, it does make a huge, huge difference. Um, and, and he's actually got, he went on to write his own sort of environmental newsletter that the school would then send out, um, which was amazing. So sort of real life stories of what the students are doing um, and how it can influence in their home lives as well. Um, but I mean, so Rob, who I spoke to at, at Cheney School, a lot of, um, he uses the students a lot to do the, the water audits and seeing, you know, identifying where the leaks were where the taps weren't being turned off, where the energy use in a certain building was extremely high, actually looking, getting the students to look at the school's energy use and identify, wait, the heating's on during the holidays, you know, why is that? Um, so you can really use your the secondary school students to, to make a lot of change within, within the school environment. If, if I can just come in there and add to that, Alex, because I, I think, Suzanne, that, that was a point I was going to make. I've, from my experience, that kids are really passionate about global citizenship and environmental aspects. And if you can harness that passion, they will drive the direction themselves. They will tell you where they're interested in. And one of the, the, the real strengths of the work that we've done is that it's driven by the kids and what they want to do. And therefore, they enact that change. Um, and, and interestingly, after this and coming on to the, the, the previous question, um, I've got a meeting with one of our local uh, secondary students who came to this school, but he's uh, an eco on the eco committee in his school. And he wants to see how he can link up with our school to do work for us or with us. And I think that's a real positive as well, because there may be constraints within his school that will inhibit the work he can do. But we can use his expertise and age and, and support to enact some of the things we want to do as well. And that partnership working is, is really, really po uh, positive. So we're gonna move on to our presentation from the fantastic team at GAP. Um, so uh, Binar is here to, jo uh, to join us and to talk about her, um, or her their um, climate action plan at all. Um, so if you want to share your slides, that would be fantastic. There we go. Brilliant. Far Perfect. away. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having us this afternoon. Um, my name is Bina and I'm the Schools Programme Manager at Global Action Plan. And I'm going to talk um, briefly about our Schools Climate Action Plan, which also will hopefully um, answer some of the queries that um, people might be having about how can secondary school students also be involved in this because this is a tool um, that can be used by teachers, educators, but also can be a learning tool for students to also be involved in. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the tool, um, about what it does and how it works, and then also a little bit about the kind of future of the tool and where we kind of see it going, um, and there'll be time for questions at the end. So if it'll let me move quick, perfect. So the tool is an online action planner um, and I'll explain a bit about how it works in a second. But the main aim of the, of the software and the tool is to help schools identify the most relevant actions that they can take within their school. So the process of setting up your action planner for your specific school looks at um, what your campus is like, um, what your school's energy use might be like, um, the sort of actions that you might prefer to take if um, you rather focus on um, educating young people or if you'd like to take action if you've got budget available to spend so it takes all of these things into consideration and allows teachers and students to design their own downloadable action planner that can be used across the school it's free to use um, and it can be shared if um, there was an eco group that did it together or a teacher that um, undertook this plan or a member of senior leadership that did this plan then it could be shared with that with throughout the school community free of charge 
and it provides free advice and resources from environmental and educational organisations across the country, which I'll explain a little bit more in detail as we go through. So how does the tool work? So the tool starts by asking you some information about your school. It asks you for the location of your school, the amount of students you have, and then it goes um, into ask, asking you a survey of 12 questions about your school, of which some are here. So it asks you about energy efficiency, outdoor space, um, if you already do education programmes in regards to climate change, about students being lunch or having school meals. And there's lots of options that you can click through and you customise this for your own school, depending on, on what your school um, is doing and how your school functions um, as an institution. So already it's looking for information about your school specifically and allows you to tailor this tool to your school um, individually. It then moves on to show you lots of different actions and there's only over 60 actions through this tool and they're under four pathways. Um, community, which looks at um, the wider school community, so parents, community organisations, um, for instance, the example here is how can we support parents to prioritise public transport? Um, and these actions under each pathway are prioritised based on the questions that you've previously answered about the background of your school and how your school works. So it might be that um, you've answered a question in the first survey saying that you have budget available um, to invest into um, actions for this planner. And if you do, then it's likely that those priority, the, the, the actions on the um, pathway one, for instance, might be prioritised as those that involve budget because you've said that you've got budget to use. But it's all deciphered based on the questions that you've answered in the first part of setting up the action planner. Pathway two looks at curriculum. So what learning could you do in school? What sessions could there be available for school staff or for students? Pathway three looks at the culture of the school. So more about behavior change and changing attitudes of young people in the school community. And pathway four looks at campus. So what can you do to the physical environment of your school? What could you, could you do a no mo zone? Uh, could you do um, investing in solar panels? Could you change the way you're using your green space? And as you can see, each of these actions have a flower, a pound sign and a clock next to them. The flower symbolizes impact and each of these flower, pound and clock symbols are out of three. So for instance, for pathway three, we've got three flowers which shows the highest impact that you can make by undertaking this action. Um, the pound sign, if it's one pound sign, then it means it's a free action. Um, and the, the clocks represent time. Um, which three clocks is usually at least a term. Um, so it's more of a long-term investment or a long-term action. So you can choose what actions you add to your action planner. It might be that you've already done it. You can click, we've already done this. It might be that you want to do this and you can add to your action planner. It might be that for instance, it says design a no, mow zone, mow zone, no mowing zone in your school, but you don't have any green space. So you can say that it's not applicable. So again, you're tailoring this to match your school and to match what you'd like to undertake. The next thing is then once you've chosen your actions, it will create you a bespoke action planner. And this will give you more information about the specific actions that you've added. It will give you more detail as to how this action will work. So what can you do? How can you make this happen? And also it will give you information about what might have happened before in other schools or case studies of examples of this happening before or links to this action. So for instance, Nomo May is a project. Um, it will give you information about the Wildlife Trust and the RHS. Um, which will help you to undertake that action in your school. And you can at any time complete an action by ticking the tick box. You can get rid of the action if it is no longer applicable to you. But most importantly, you can share an update, which is this arrow here. And this allows um, you to update what your action is. So to provide evidence of it, maybe you've done um, a car free day or you've done a walking bus or you've um, installed solar panels or um, you've changed food in the canteen then you can add evidence to your account um, on Transmar World which is free um, and you can add photos and videos or just a bit of content about what you might have done. The reason why we ask for updates is a really important part of the, the work we do at Transformer World is collaborating and sharing with teachers, educators, networks, organisations. We'd really love to share even more updates about schools, um, case studies that people are undertaking um, and examples of this action plan are actually physically happening. So the sharing update option allows us to then 
feature the updates from schools on our web on our web page to inspire other schools to do the same. And as I showed in this section here, then we add the updates to this looking for inspiration section. So it might be that it will have an example of this school has done this as an action, see what they did as a lovely example so that you can be inspired to do the same. So how do you access the tool? The tool is through the Transform Our World website. And um, this is a free website. You're required to register as a user. Um, we've got just over 5,000 teachers and educators who are part of our community. And we would really love for, to kind of increase that moving forward. So please do, if you're not already registered to become a Transform Our World user, there's lots of other things as well as this tool on our website, including resources and programs. Um, but if you want to access the School Climate Action Planner specifically, you can navigate to the tool section of the website and select the Climate Action Planner and get going. Um, it should take maximum of half an hour to answer the questions about your school. Um, obviously, there might be some questions that you might need to ask colleagues or other members of school about um, to find out um, more details. But you can get going straight away. We've had over 200 schools already start on their Action Planner journey, which is really, really exciting. Just briefly, this is something that's in the works at the moment, um, but I wanted to kind of um, provide this update to everyone so that you're aware that it can happen in the future. Currently, we are in development undergoing final testing of creating a localised planner. So this will mean that actions, for instance, as uh, an example being invest in additional bike storage in your school or invest in, in bicycles that students can use to travel to school will provide localised information about actions. So it might be that your local council has funding opportunities available that you could use to, um, to make this happen. It might be that there's specific events in your area or specific um, campaigns that local organisations or authorities are investing in supporting in. So the action planner will become more localised and will allow you to see, as well as more general actions, also actions that are relevant to your school postcode area or your local authority area as well. So that's in the mix at the moment. And additionally, um, this is in the really early stages, but we are starting to work with specific local authorities, um, which is more of a kind of um, local authority level or um, for individuals who have oversight over multiple schools to be able to see the impacts of multiple schools in one go. So for instance, the collection of schools in a local authority area, um, we're developing the technology so that, um, for instance, um, a transport officer or someone who works in a local authority could have oversight over multiple schools, the actions that they're undertaking to, again, see the impact and the fantastic work that schools are doing on the ground to really make that difference and to move, to, to move towards being more sustainable. Um, but that, in terms of that development, that's, that's quite long term. And um, we're currently having conversations individually with local authorities. But if you know of anyone who might be interested and wanted to talk to us, then please do get in touch. Um, you can get in touch with me and I'm really happy to have a conversation about that. Um, but I think that's everything about the School Action Planner. Um, but just to re-emphasize, it's free. Um, you can use it how you like as a school. Um, you, it's there to be tailored for you. And if there's, um, yeah, it, it offers a range of actions that um, you can add to your Action Planner of a range of pathways. So it really is a tool that's there for you. So please do use it and, and um, yeah, get started. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a brilliant sort of whirlwind tour of, of what is a really interesting and engaging tool. And so well done to the team at GAP for, for pulling that together. And it's, and it's really exciting to see, see it now in use and uh, also the plans that you've got for it. And then we've got a question in about multi-academy trusts and um, almost kind of answered it right at the end, actually about schools that they've grouped together. Is it something that a, a trust of schools could use collectively for, for all of their schools or, or does it always need to be a school by school at this stage? Yeah, I think at this stage it's a school by school basis, but we're looking into how can we adapt the technology so that it can be used for multiple schools um, because of that example, yeah. Um, but that's that's in the early stages and we're, we're kind of like looking for funding in terms of that development. But yeah, individual school basis at the moment, but definitely something we want to expand on in the future. That's fantastic. Any other questions from our from our panelists um, uh, to uh, the fantastic GAP team? No, OK, so right, we're now going to um, so we can have uh, sort of more general questions now. And I do have a question 
for for well all all of our panelists really about how it influences not just the students in your school but it influences the staff and how do you think their behaviors have changed and ed ed talked about how in the garden when you're doing the gardening the staff didn't really know much about gardening do they know a bit more now ed uh yes they do yeah they're a bit lot more confident uh, you know they've, they've been able to go out with the volunteers and and see from them learn from them uh you know how to grow and you know start off basic start off simple you know uh, um you know potatoes are always a good 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 place to start beans um again another easy place to start and i think yeah all the staff are a lot more confident um in their growing skills and uh and more and more staff are going out with their their children uh to, to have a go um that's what the children want to see you know they want to see their their, their teacher getting stuck in and, and getting dirty with them as well so um yeah that's great to hear and always good to hear when people are learning how to grow potatoes uh, which is very important so yeah over now just to say thank you very much uh for being part of this webinar our first webinar so it's been recorded so the recording will be on the website so if you in the audience and you want to share it with any of your colleagues you'll be able to do that from next week so you can use it please join us for future webinars the next one will be um, at the end of march and it is going to be on the theme specifically of energy and we're looking at doing another one soon on governance as well so we're looking forward to having you all join us for those but uh, just for me to say thank you very much to, for everyone who has been part of this um, and we look forward to seeing how all these actions keep growing and getting lots and lots more schools to sign up to Let's Go Zero. So thank you very much.